Hey y'all, welcome back uh, to uh, uh, the lecture that's going to cover chapter 13, which is all about risk and uh, return and the stock market okay. um, and how we incorporate that into our analysis of the firm and our project analysis. So this is the second to last chapter. Um, and uh, so there's just one more, which is chapter 14 on what's called the firm's cost of capital. Um, and this is our lead into that, but it's also the first place where we finally get to talk about something that we've been putting off talking about all semester, which is risk. Right? And so far we've talked a lot about risk, but we have not talked of any, in, almost any about how to estimate risk, right? Or return. Because remember one of the fundamental rules of finance is that risk and return trade off one for one. Right? Now the first place we, we even broached this subject was back in the bond chapter when we talked about how to estimate the, uh, the coupon rate, the interest rate on a loan, right? We talked about thinking about all of the risks that were incumbent in making a loan and then estimating a premium based on each of those risks, adding all those premiums together to get the final interest rate that we would charge, right? And there were a bunch of risks involved with making a loan. There's the risk that somebody doesn't pay us back, which is default risk. There's the risk that uh, the tax laws change because we get a, a, a tax benefit for paying interest. So that's the tax risk. There's the, the real rate of interest risk. There's the market interest risk. There's the liquidity risk. There was like seven or eight risks that we talked about. Right? So we can enumerate them. We can then decide how risky that those things actually are for each firm. Uh, you know, What's the chance that they don't pay us back? What's the chance that the tax laws change? We can try to estimate some premium for all those, add them all together, then that's the interest rate, right? So that's the first time we, we even sort of broached the subject of how risk and return trade off and, and how they work together. But that's much more difficult to do when we're talking about firm risk or when we're talking about stock risk. That's because there just are too many risks to think about, right? What are the risks involved with uh, purchasing a share of stock? What are the risks involved with operating a business? Well, they're uncountable, right? They aren't as discreet because they're not a contract that has all of the terms written out, right? So when we talk about risk in an equity sense or, or when we talk about risk in a firm sense, we have to start to think about risk in a different way than we have before, right? And that's because risk when in the financial and economic sense actually means something slightly different than the risk that you might be thinking of what, just when I say the word risk, right? the colloquial sense. Because the colloquial sense of risk actually only thinks about what we call downside risk, which is what's the negative outcome, right? If I ask you what the risk of going skydiving is, your mind immediately jumps to uh, falling through the air and trying to pull a parachute that doesn't pull and then splat. You're, you're on the ground, right? That's the risk of going skydiving. But that's really just the downside risk. In finance and economics, what we call risk really is just the variation in potential outcomes. And so that means that if our, in our skydiving example, the variation in potential outcomes goes from the good to the bad, right? And that's true in the financial sense too. So the financial risk, so to speak, in going skydiving is that on the one hand, you might have a really incredible time. You have the best time ever. That's your upside risk. Or you go splat and that's your downside risk. Now, do we care more about downside risk? In general, we, we probably do. But mathematically, and when we talk about how to calculate and estimate risk uh, in, in mathematics, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, okay? So uh, we're gonna talk about how to estimate risk, how we think about risk in, 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 fi in the financial sense. Uh, but to do that, we need to first talk about uh, return, uh, because risk and return trade off, right? The more risk, the more return. Uh, and that's a really natural thing, uh, but uh, it, it does bear some more discussion. And we'll start by talking about uh, what are called expected returns. And this is actually a sort of an, an important distinction, okay? So expected returns are probability weighted potential outcomes, right? And it's this potential outcomes or the possible outcomes thing that really matters. And that's because risk is about the future. If the outcomes are already known, if the future is already known, then risk starts to disappear 
because I already know what's going to happen. I don't have any risk, right? If I know my parachute is, is not going to pull out, then I just don't go. If I know I'm going to have a great time, then I'm not worried about not, the parachute not going, right? So risk is about the future and it's about unknown things happening. And so what we're interested in, in comparing it to here, when we, t when we say expected returns, we're talking about potential future outcomes that we don't know, right? So I'm thinking about risk of taking an action that I haven't taken yet. Not about the risk doesn't have anything to do with an action that's already been taken because the outcome's already known, okay? So in, when we say expected return, you can think about this in a general way as the average outcome. If we uh, happen to run the, uh, run the take this risk uh, uh, or take this action a number of times, okay? So uh, here's the formula for expected return. It says that the expected return of some asset is equal to the sum of the probability of each potential outcome times the actual return in that outcome, right? Or what we'll start to say, because we're just gonna talk about this in terms of stock, we'll say the probability of each state occurring times the return in that state, okay? So uh, don't get intimidated by the formula here. Uh, we will uh, we'll work a bunch of examples. Um, but uh, the, a better way to think about expected return is go back to the probability class that you hopefully taken already, right? And, and, and think about what, uh, uh, what happens if we flip a coin, right? So let's say we flip a coin, and if, I, if we flip the coin on heads, you give me a dollar. If, uh, if I flip the coin onto tails, I give you a dollar, right? What we wanna, what, when we think about expected return, we think about the expected return of some action like this, the action being flipping the coin, and then the outcomes being either I flip heads or I flip tails. Now, the probability of those outcomes is 50-50, right? If it's a fair weighted coin, 50% chance of flipping heads, 50% chance of flipping tails. That's what the P represents in this formula. What's the probability of each state or each outcome occurring? Well, here the action is flipping the coin, the outcomes are heads or tails, and I have a 50% chance of that. Now, the R in the formula is what's the return in each state. And the return is, if it's heads, you give me a dollar. If it's tails, I give you a dollar, right? So the expected return of this scenario is 50-50. Uh, 50% 50 50 times one plus 50% times one, right? But I probably already know that, right? The important part is in thinking about how this changes over time, right? So what's the, I think of first, think about what the outcome is if we only flip the coin once. If I only flip the coin once, somebody wins and somebody loses. So let's say we flip it and it lands on tails. I give you a dollar. I lost a dollar, you won a dollar. Right? The expected return is the average outcome if we do this a bunch. Right? If we flip the coin a thousand times, well, the first time I'll give you a dollar, the second time you'll give me a dollar, the third time I'll give you a dollar, the fourth time you'll give me a dollar, the fifth time you'll give me a dollar, the sixth time I'll give you a dollar. And over a, a, a great many actions, the average outcome is 50-50. 50% of the time you win, 50% of the time I win. And so the average, the expected return here is that we come out exactly even, right? Nobody has won more than the other person because we have a fair, equally weighted coin. But the expected return is, is, is even, but that doesn't have anything to do with the actual return, which is somebody wins and somebody loses a dollar, right? So the expected return, when we're talking about probabilities and when we're talking about financial outcomes, it doesn't even have to be a possible actual outcome. Right? In fact, it isn't. The expected return on our coin flip is 50 cents, right? Because you're going to win half of the, the, the winnings. Uh, but no one ever actually wins 50 cents. We all just win a dollar or lose a dollar. If we do it a bunch, we'll come out. If we flip the coin 100 times, we might win 50, and, and I might win 50 times, and you win 50 times, and then our actual outcomes is 50-50, right? So expected returns is about what's the... What is, the, what is the, our best guess about the future of the world, right? 
And what do we think is most likely to happen if we take this action? Right? And it's based on the range of potential actions, the range of potential outcomes.